Well, I hate to admit this, but recently I got myself a traffic ticket. Don't judge me. You know you all been there before. But, and before you judge me, you need to understand it wasn't my fault. Okay? Because nobody told me that there were cameras at the intersection on 44th Street. Well, that's not entirely true. Because minutes before it happened, my wife told me there were cameras at that intersection. But other than that, this was not my fault. I didn't know about them, right? So, you know, if you've ever had this happen, as soon as we went through the intersection, there was like this flash. And I was like, what in the world was that? You know? And I wasn't going that fast, at least by my standards. And so there was a part of me that hoped maybe just somebody just decided to take a picture of me as I was going through the intersection, or maybe it was a reflection off from something. I don't know. It couldn't have possibly been a camera taking a picture of me as I was driving just peacefully down 44th Street. And so I just sort of sloughed it off, and weeks went by, and I was certain like I was in the clear until I got a thank you note from the local traffic department letting me know that I now had the opportunity to give to their organization. <laughs> and um, now I was eligible to take the driving class, so I did that so it wouldn't go on my record. Maybe some of you have done that before. Um, it's a little annoying, but it's better than having to pay the ticket. Uh, but you know what the worst part of all of this was? Is uh, the ticket had pictures on it. And on, the, on one side, there was a picture of the back of my car, and on the other side, it was a picture of the front of the car, and in the picture in the front of my car was my wife sitting right next to me, and I'm pretty sure it was in that moment that she was saying, you might want to slow down through here, <laughs> and the camera got me. Now, if you've ever gotten a traffic ticket, you know that how deflating it can be, right? Now, this was kind of a weird thing. The camera took a picture, but if you've ever had those cherries come on, behind you and you look in the rearview mirror, your heart just sinks, right? You're like, oh man, no way. You know, I'm in a rush. I got somewhere to go and I'm going to have to pay all this money. And the only thing that you can do to make things right with the situation is to simply pay what's required. That's the only way, right? I mean, you can go to tr court, I guess, and try to plead your case. I don't know anybody that's ever done that before, although I'm sure there are some. But when there's a picture of you, on the ticket, right? It's kind of hard to plead your case. No, it wasn't me. Like, sir, this is you right here and your, your very wise wife sitting next to you. You're right here, right? So you just, you have to take your medicine and you have to pay the fine or you have to go through the defensive driver's class, which by the way, costs money as well. And it's the only way to expunge the ticket from your record, which is how life works. Right? Like, we know how this is how life works. You make a mistake and you have to pay what's required. You sin against the other person and you pay the price, whatever that might be. You choose the wrong path and you have to deal with the consequences of your actions. This is just how the world works. And we know this. We go through it day after day after day. But what if you didn't actually have to pay the ticket? What, what, yeah, it would be great, wouldn't it, Jane? My bank account would like that. What, what, if, what if the ticket were, were just torn up as if it never happened before? Well, as, as my wife, my very wise wife mentioned, uh, we're continuing in this series in the book of Acts. So I want you to grab your phone if you haven't done so yet. You can open up the YouVersion Bible app. You can follow along with everything we're going to cover today. We're going to cover a lot of scripture today. So it's a great way to be able to go back and reference that. Just go under more in events and find Genesis Church there. If you're in your Bibles, we're going to be in Acts chapter 13 again this week. Now just a quick recap from where we've been up to this point in chapter 13. Paul and his companions, Barnabas and John Mark, have embarked on the first of what will be three missionary treks through the Roman Empire. And I want to just bring up this map. I brought it up last week to give you an idea of where they are right now. So they start in Antioch 
all the way over in Syria, and they take off from Seleucia. They go to Salamis in Cyprus, and they head to Paphos in Cyprus. When they're in Paphos, we learn at the start of Acts chapter 13, they run into a guy named Bar-Jesus, and he's a false prophet. And the governor of that area is really interested in who Paul is and what he has to say, and he comes a believer, and they, they, they push aside Bar-Jesus. And then they take off from Paphos, and they head up to Pamphylia, and now they're in Antioch and Pisidia, all the way up North. They've traveled a long distance here. There are no electric vehicles, right? There are no Teslas on the road in first century Roman Empire. There are roads, but there are no Teslas there. They're walking, they're, by, they're riding, they're, they're, they're going by ship. This is taking days, if not weeks, for them to get where they need to be. And so once they're there in Antioch of Pisidia, or excuse me, yeah, Pisidia, they start to have these interactions. They, they go to the temple, the synagogue in the area, on the Sabbath to worship. That's what we do. That's what they would have done in the first century. They go to worship, and they, they're there, and they're singing, and they're praying, and they're hearing the scriptures. And it was not uncommon when visitors, especially visitors like Paul and Barnabas, who would have been considered leaders within the Jewish religion at the time, to be invited to say something uh, uh, to the to, to people who are in attendance at the synagogue. And so Paul is invited. Come, they, the religious leaders are like, come say something. You know, give us an encouragement. Give us a word from God. Not knowing they were inviting somebody to throw a theological grenade in the synagogue service that morning. And so Paul stands up and he starts to talk about Jesus. And he tells them, Jesus, Jesus is the Savior of of Israel that you are promised in the Old Testament that you've been waiting for all your lives. And he is saving people from the bondage of sin and he's calling them into a new life with him. And as we pick up the story in verse 26, Paul is going to continue to expound on the person and the work of Jesus to these listeners, much like us in the first century. And he's going to talk about what it means that what he did and how he lived, what it means for all of us for all time. Now, we, we talked about a couple weeks ago that I think it's important to mention it again, that Paul has spent years thinking through everything he's about to say. This is not just coming to him as he's speaking. We, we know from the text and some signals throughout it that, that Paul has spent about a decade studying and putting the, the, the connections together between the Old Testament and the New Testament, what Jesus has done. And only after about 10 years of, of working through that is he now starting to make his way into the Roman Empire and helping other people connect the dots themselves. And he does it in brilliant, brilliant fashion. So let's pick it up. Chapter 13, starting in verse 26. Paul says, brothers, you sons of Abraham, and also you God-fearing Gentiles. A God-fearing Gentile would have been somebody who wasn't born Jewish, but is now converted to Judaism. He says, this message of salvation has been sent to us. The people in Jerusalem and their leaders did not recognize Jesus as the one the prophets had spoken about. Instead, they condemned him, and in doing this, they fulfilled the prophet's words that are read every Sabbath. They found no legal reason to execute him, but they asked Pilate to have him killed anyway. When they had done all that the prophets he said about him, they took him down from the cross and placed him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And over a period of many days, he appeared to those who had gone with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to the people of Israel. So Paul goes on to make mention that Jesus is the very person those in the synagogue that day were reading about every Sabbath service. He makes mention of that. These texts that you're reading from Isaiah, Jeremiah, the Old Testament texts and the Torah, all of it is about Jesus. And I'm here to tell you about that. But what's ironic, Paul says, is that while they were hoping, the Israelites, they're hoping for the Savior they were also fulfilling everything the prophets said would happen to the very person they're talking about. They condemned Jesus. 
they executed Jesus and they placed his body in a tomb. All the prophecies that they read about on a Sunday or a Saturday in their case had come true in the person of Jesus through them. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 3 talks about the condemnation that Jesus, they would read this passage over and over and over where it says he was despised and rejected. A man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. In that same chapter, Isaiah goes on to talk about the death of Jesus where it says, but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. And then, Isaiah says in chapter 9 that he was buried, that he had done no wrong and had never succeeded anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. You see what Paul is doing here? He's telling the story of what really happened with Jesus, and he's connecting the dots with these passages those who were in attendance would read day after day, week after week, year after year year. You've read Isaiah 53, he's saying. And by the way, it is speaking about the man, Jesus, who I know, who has changed my life. And I'm here to tell you about him. Now, Paul isn't bringing this up, though, to condemn those who are listening, but instead to bring them hope. And so this is what he says next, verse 32. He says, and now we're here to bring you this good news. This is good news. The promise was made to our ancestors and God has now fulfilled it for us, their descendants by raising Jesus. This is what the second Psalm says about Jesus. You are my son, today I have become your father. For God had promised to raise him from the dead, not leaving him to rot in the grave. He said, I will give you the sacred blessings I promised to David. Now to be fair, I want to be honest, there were a lot of opinions about resurrection in the first century, okay? So Paul is saying, this is good news. Jesus died. He is the one that Isaiah 53 talks about. He died for our sins and he was raised to life after we've been buried in a rich man's grave. This is good news. But there was a lot of debate about resurrection in the first century, as it is today. Like if you go out on the street and you ask people, do you believe in resurrection? You're probably going to get a variety of different answers. But even among Jews, there was a, there was a debate among them. For those who were considered Pharisees, they believed the resurrection was going to happen. The bodily resurrection, not only of the Savior, but of them eventually as well. But the Sadducees, another leading group within Judaism, did not believe it. So there was a lot of like, you know, iron sharpening iron, butting heads over this very topic. And it caused a lot of debate among those who were listening. And there were passages like Hosea chapter 6 verse 2 that they debated where it says this, after two days, he, speaking of the Savior, will revive us, and on the third day, he will raise us up that we may live before him. What does that mean, they would say? It can't possibly mean resurrection, right? can't possibly mean that. So Paul is making the claim that Jesus confirmed and fulfilled the words of Hosea. Say, you debate these words all the time, but you need to understand that I've done the research, I've had the experience and Jesus fulfills those very words. Resurrection has happened. So Paul goes on from there. Acts chapter 13, verses 35 through 37. My phone. I just got a new watch, by the way. And it was just talking to me. I don't know why. I apologize. I don't know how to run it yet. Here we go. Except it said, are you talking to me? Maybe I am, Siri. Yeah, maybe you need to hear this too. <laughs> that scared me to death. I thought that was you, Jane. I thought you were yelling at me. Are you talking to me? All right, Acts chapter 13, 35 whew, through 37. Let's hang, hang with me. Here we go. Another psalm explains it more fully. You will not allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. This is not a reference to David, for after David had done the will of God in his own generation, he died and was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. It was a reference to someone else, someone whom God raised and whose body did not decay. T to make sure that they understand, hey, listen, we're talking about one person here. It's not David. It's not the king that we, you know, we all admire. It is 
Jesus. And he's quoting Psalm chapter 16, verse 10, which says, For you'll not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. Again, he's connecting the dots for those listening. These passages that you know from the Old Testament, they have been fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus. I want you to get this because this will change your life when you understand that everything that God has been doing in history up to this moment has been fulfilled and accomplished in the work of Jesus Christ. And he wants there to be no confusion whatsoever. And so Paul is establishing this theological and biblical groundwork, right? It's a little wordy, it's a little heady, but he's establishing this groundwork for the good news that he's bringing. He's about to make it really personal for those who are listening. He's about to make it really personal for us. Verse 38. Brothers, listen. We're here to proclaim that through this man, Jesus, there is forgiveness for your sins. Everyone who believes in him is made right in God's sight, something the law of Moses could never do. Be careful. Don't let the prophet's words apply to you. For they said, look, you mockers, be amazed, from die, be amazed and die. For I'm doing something new in your own day, something you wouldn't believe even if someone told you about it. And with that, it's as if Paul pulls the pin on his theological grenade and just throws it in the room. In particular, Paul says something in verse 39 that would have shattered the mindset of those who were there and should shatter the mindset of us here. This is maybe the most controversial and explosive thing he could have possibly said in that moment. Verse 39 says, Everyone who believes in him is made right in God's sight. Something the law of Moses could never do. Look, there are so many things happening in this verse. I only have a short time to cover it. I could probably preach six sermons on this verse. Okay? But there's a few things I want to point out. And the first thing is this. You have to understand who Paul is to understand the revolutionary words that he is saying in this moment. We know from other letters that he wrote, Paul, and earlier in the book of Acts, that Paul was a Pharisee. And he wasn't just any Pharisee. He was like the captain of the Pharisees, right? He was a Pharisee among Pharisees. He followed the Jewish law to the T. And for those who didn't, he either confronted them or in many cases, he killed them. Including those who followed Jesus. Especially those who followed Jesus. But with Paul's encounter with Jesus in Acts chapter 8, everything changes for him. And he realizes, oh my goodness, I've been living my whole life trying to be this good person. We don't say that, right? I've been living my whole life just trying to be a good person. To live by all the rules that everybody told me I'm supposed to follow. Making sure that everybody looks up to me and loves me. And I've realized none of that can accomplish what I really need in my life and being made right with God only Through Jesus Christ can that be accomplished. Do you see how revolutionary this is for Paul? I mean, he was a celebrity among Jews in the first century before he becomes a Christian. People knew Paul. And now he's standing before those who are in this synagogue and he's saying, all that stuff I used to believe about being a good person and doing all the right stuff, none of it matters apart from Jesus. Some of you need to hear that today. You have been striving in this life to get it all right, to be a good person, to do all of and check all the boxes. And Paul is saying, look, it's all well and good. There's nothing wrong with doing the right thing and being moral in this world, but in the end, it doesn't make you right with God. There's only one thing that makes you right with God, he says, and that's Jesus. That's Jesus. You know, the law of Moses, as he refers to, is wrapped up in the first five books of the Old Testament. Right? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The law of Moses. And after the entrance of sin in the world and the freeing of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, God gives them this 
code of conduct, if you will, of which he asks them, live by this. Be an example to the world. These are laws to govern yourselves and to keep you separate and holy from the rest of the world. It was a good thing. And it was believed as a result over time that for someone to be in a right relationship with God, they must follow the law of Moses perfectly. And if they didn't, sacrifices need to be made on their behalf to make sure that forgiveness is received. Which means that every time that you would sin or go against God's law of Moses, you had to go to the temple and slaughter something. A blood offering to say, forgive me, God. As a pastor, I am grateful that we do not practice that anymore. I don't want your dead chickens, you know. It scares me, but this is how it was done. And so every Sabbath, those in the synagogue in Pisidia, they would gather and they would listen to the law and the prophets in an effort to become more and more obedient to God's law. And they would make sacrifices and they would give offerings with the hope that it would all keep them in this right relationship with God. It was exhausting. And now Paul is saying, it's a bunch of garbage. The book of Philippians, he calls it garbage. It, it's a worthless effort because of Jesus. He's saying being made right, it cannot be made, you cannot be made right by doing all the right things. But being a good person, you can, it, it doesn't happen that way. There's only one way. And the only way we have a right relationship with God is through Jesus. He says in verse 39 that it is by believing in Jesus that we're made right with God. That we have a new relationship, a right relationship with God, a fulfilling and abundant relationship with God. You see, Jesus did what we couldn't do. Right? He came to this earth and he lived a perfect, sinless life. And then he was sacrificed once and for all, for all sin, for all time, the law having been fulfilled on our behalf, he was able to sacrifice himself for us. And so attempting to make it right ourselves through obedience, it's just a worthless effort. Only, Paul says, in believing in Jesus are we placed into a peaceful, right relationship with God. That is the good news. Now, if it weren't enough that the uh, law of Moses is unable to make a person right with God, and that it's only believing in Jesus that it's possible. Paul begins verse 39 with something that maybe may be more shocking than any of that to those who are listening in the first century. Because Paul says at the very beginning of verse 39, he uses this word, everyone. Everyone and anyone who believes. Right? It was commonly believed that those who were Jewish, those who were either born into Judaism, those who had either converted to Judaism, they, they were the ones who were invited to be right with God. Nobody else. But now, Paul says, the door has swung open to all people. Jewish, non-Jewish, doesn't matter. Those who have converted to Judaism or not. He says, everyone. To the ends of the earth, Jesus says, I want this news to go out. Here's what Paul is saying in this moment without really saying it. He is saying that it is only grace that has made you right through Jesus. This is not a message those who are in attendance really want to hear. Because you know what it's saying? It's saying all that work that you've done over the course of your life doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is receiving and believing in the grace of God through Jesus Christ. That's it. You didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. But it's here for the taking. That is a message that has changed my life drastically. Recognizing that God looked down on us in his love that we sung about earlier and said, I'm coming to you. You're, you could never be good enough. You could never match up but I'm going to come to you 
in undeserved grace and kindness to you to do what you couldn't do for yourselves so that we could be made right. So that you would be an heir to everything that I have to offer. Offer The creator of the world has invited us into a new relationship with him through Jesus Christ. And there's nothing you have to do other than say yes. He's telling those listening that through their own efforts and obeying the law given by Moses, it's a worthless pursuit. And you know, we've constructed our own laws. We've decided, like, if I do these things, then, then, then God will, you know, he'll be okay with me, right? And that, that list can vary based on who we are, what we believe, what we think. And Paul said, just throw it away. The only thing that matters is Jesus, right? Romans chapter 3, verse 22, Paul says, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for what's the word? Everyone, yeah, you, and you, everyone who believes, no matter who we are. I love that. No matter who we are. And that's it. That's why all of this exists. That's why we're here today. That's why we sing songs. That's why you come here, and that's why I prepare to to give a message from God. Not because I'm calling you to, to do a bunch of stuff, but because I'm, I'm simply calling you to receive what I've received. This free gift of eternal life that begins today, forever and ever and ever, that comes through the one who has made it right. We, we the church, we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ, and that's it. And no matter who you are, Paul says, no matter what you have done, let me just say that again, okay? Because I want you to hear this. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, this promise, this truth is for you. When you believe in him, you are made right with God, a peaceful, loving relationship with him. Now, for those in that synagogue this day, This meant that all of their striving to try and be good before God could be put to rest. And instead, Paul says, the only requirement was a simple invitation to believe in the one God promised in Isaiah 53. And for us here today, this means that all of our striving to be this person that we've conjured up in our minds or that somebody has told us that we need to become maybe even the church unfortunately it can be put to rest and instead the same invitation exists for us today that it did for those in the first century to come and believe to place your faith in the one who accomplished it all for us who lived the life we couldn't live, who died the death we deserve, and who rose again three days later to give us new and eternal life. Let me say it again. Grace has made you right through Jesus Christ. It's only grace. You don't have to work to earn it. You don't have to pay a price for the sins of your past. You don't have to hold on to the shame of your mistakes. Jesus Jesus has paid it all. And not because you somehow proved it, but because he loves you. That's it. He lived the life you couldn't live, perfect and sinless. He died the death that we deserve for their past. And he rose again because he loves us. He desires a right relationship with us. Now, I don't know what version of God you've heard growing up in your life. But the God that I know, the God of the Bible, the creator of this world, is in a relentless pursuit of you. And he is saying, I need you to stop trying so hard to be something, A, I probably never created you to be, and B, that I've already offered to you on a silver platter to come and receive. He's saying, I love you so much, would you just take a step of faith towards me? I will make you right. I will change your life. I will give you hope and a purpose. You know, it's common in our American culture, I think, that we believe if we want to be made right in this world, we got we to gotta be good at being good. We got to figure it out. 
We got to follow the rules. We got to think the way that God wants us to think. We got to put our stakes in the sand and decide this is who we are and this is what we're going to do. And, but here's the problem. Being good is a moving target. I mean, just it depends on who you ask. Right? It doesn't account for the sin and the mistakes in our lives. So let me just be very clear about this because this is the predominant view of God and our relationship with God in this world, that if I just be a good person, then God has to accept me. But that's not in the Bible. You won't find it. All it says is that God is good and that out of his love, he is making a new way through Jesus Christ for us to be made right in his relationship with him. Only through God's grace can we be made right with him. Only by believing Jesus did what we could never do and receiving his forgiveness and new life are we made right. Now, I love how Luke ends this section because I think this is really important for us, especially those of us who already have received that invitation of grace. Here's how Luke ends this passage In Acts chapter 13, verses 42 and 43, he says, As Paul and Barnabas left the synagogue that day, the people begged them to speak about these things again the next week. Many Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, and the two men urged them to continue to rely on the grace of God. He said, you've been made right with God's grace. And through God's grace. So continue to rely on the grace of God. He said, this is not a one and done kind of thing. Right? We, we need to rely on the story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection every single day. We need the reminder that God's grace is sufficient and available for us every day. When we make that mistake, his grace is still there. When we feel that shame, his grace is still there. When we sense ourselves trying to earn his acceptance, his grace is still there. So here's the invitation to all of us. The same invitation that Paul gave to those who were listening on that day. Rely on God's grace through Jesus. It will make you right with him. Maybe for the first time this morning, you need to take that step and you need to say, yeah, I have been trying to do this on my own for far too long. And Jesus is calling you saying, believe in me. Receive my grace. Or maybe for the millionth time this morning, you need to receive that grace again. Because for whatever reason, you have just been trudging through life, trying to make it right yourself. And God is walking alongside you saying, will you just trust me in this? Will you allow my grace to fill your life again? And he wants to whisper these words to you again this morning in Acts 13, 39, to say, everyone who believes in him is made right in God's sight. And my grace is available today. The ticket has been paid. There is nothing left for you to do but believe. Place your faith in Jesus. That is the invitation in Acts chapter 13. Place your faith in Jesus and receive God's grace for you today. Let's pray. God, I I will confess. Maybe I'll be the first in this room to confess. that That I forget this. I am often unaware of how abundant your grace is. And I find myself striving in this life, trying to make it right, trying to do it right, trying to be the good person. And this passage reminds me again of just how incredibly abundantly gracious you are to us. That through your life, death, and resurrection, You are all we need. That every morning we can wake up and we can be reminded that your grace is sufficient for us that day and that no matter what may come, no matter what mistakes we may make, make, no matter what decisions, good or bad, we may make, your grace is still there. That we've been made right with you through Jesus Christ. 
and also the promise that when that happens, when our new relation is formed with us, that you give to us this gift of the Holy Spirit living in us, that we might live in the way that you would have us live. That is your grace again. And so I pray this morning, whether it is for the first time or whether it is for the millionth time, that we would receive your grace. That we would see how amazingly loving and kind and gracious you are to us. That as we walk from this building and we walk into the rest of our lives, that we would walk in your grace. Knowing that this life, it is fulfilled and has purpose because of you and what you have done. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his willingness and his humility to come and live among us and to live in a way we could never live, to willingly go to the cross and die for us, to raise him from the dead three days later that we might have hope from now and all the way into eternity. And it's in his name we